Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association webinar, Insights on Housing Trajectories for Newcomers and Refugees. I'm Kristen Holinsky, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives at CHRA, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I'll give a brief overview of the webinar technology. I'll then introduce our agenda and our speakers for this afternoon presentation. Today's webinar is in real time. You should now be able to see a title screen of today's presentation and be able to hear me via your computer speakers, headset, or through your telephone if you've chosen to dial in. You're currently all muted and we do this to minimize background noise. However, if you wish to ask questions at any time during the presentation, which we encourage you to do so, you may type your question into the dialog box on the webinar control panel. We will address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar during the Q&A section. At this point, if you're having problems with the technology, please call Sue Ann Hall at the CHRA office. Her contact information is available in the text box on your screen, as well as a link to troubleshooting if you're having any audio connection difficulties. Moving on to the agenda for today, CHRA is pleased to have with us Damaris Rose, Professor in Urban Studies at l'Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal, Quebec, and Ray Silvius, Assistant Professor at the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba. So thank you both for being with us today. This webinar will explore key settlement, integration, housing and relocation challenges being undertaken in Montreal and Winnipeg to address the necessity of providing safe, adequate housing for newcomers. In particular, speakers will address new and ongoing research pertaining to the Syrian refugee crisis and how to shed light on some of the gaps in the Canadian affordable housing system, as well as to solutions and approaches being undertaken to address these challenges. We'll start with a macro level overview of the housing system in context to refugee and newcomer housing and research being undertaken at l'Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal, followed by a more focused analysis of what's taking place at the local level in Winnipeg. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our first speaker, Damaris Rose, Professor in Urban Studies at l'Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal. Damaris is an urban social geographer by training. She's been involved in research on the urban dimensions of immigration and refugee settlement issues for two decades, and for a number of years was coordinator of the Housing and Neighborhoods Research Domain at the Montreal Center of the Pan-Canadian Metropolis Project. So she's just obtained a research grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council's Rapid Response Initiative on Syrian Refugees. Her project's titled Finding Housing for the Welcome Syrianese Refugee Newcomers, a Cross-Canada Analysis of Initiatives, Challenges, and Lessons Learned. It'll be conducted in collaboration with Valerie Preston of York University and Kathy Sherrill of the Immigration Services Society of BC. And the research will take place over the next eight months. So welcome, Damaris, and I now turn it over to you. Hi, thank you very much to Kristen and to CHRA for inviting me and thank you all for coming. This is my first experience doing a webinar so I'm absolutely terrified and hope the technology does not uh, uh, does not fail me. Um, so um, this is the um, this is the unfocused presentation before the focused one on Winnipeg. So um, what I'm going to do is provide a very quick background on refugee stream admissions to Canada and an overview of research on housing experiences new and of newcomers in the refugee streams. Uh, what do we already know or what do we think we know? Then I'm going to provide an overview of the Welcome Syrians uh, operation, including um, um, some uh, numbers that I've calculated based on the available data to give you an idea of the breakdown between different categories of refugees and very, very interesting numbers on the breakdown by geography. Uh, which I'll share with you, even though it's uh, it's an incomplete analysis. Then um, the issue of finding housing, tactics and challenges, what emerging uh, knowledge, what are the emerging issues, emerging questions. So this rather uh, busy slide provides some context for uh, understanding uh, the scale of the Syrian uh, refugee admissions. So. Um, so far in the past 10 months since the, opera, the, the Welcome Syrians operation started, there have been about 30,000 um, 30, uh, Syrian refugees that have arrived in 10 months, um, compared with um, 23,286 for the whole of 2014. But before you start thinking, wow, that's just a huge number of Syrians that we've admitted, not really, because um, the proportion of refugees uh, in the total emissions to Canada every year has been shrinking for 
a long time. And back in the 1980s, early 1990s, refugees were a much higher proportion of the total uh, admission stream. It's just that it hasn't happened for a while. So that, I think that's important to bear in mind. Then you probably all know about the different categories of refugees, but um, they're divided administratively, first of all, into what we call overseas stream and in Canada stream. So in Canada stream means people who file a refugee claim in Canada and they succeed, they become successful refugee claimants and then they join uh, the category of permanent residency. Overseas streams is what we're talking about now uh, for 99.9% .9 of the Syrian arrivals to, to Canada and they fall into either the government assisted refugee category or the privately sponsored category as well as a third category which is new since 2013, which is a hybrid between government assisted and the uh, privately sponsored. And it basically means that half of the money and moral, moral emotional support is from uh, federal funding and the other half is from the private sponsorship group. An overview of federally funded assistance for the refugee streams. Again, you probably know this, but just in case. Uh, whether a refugees are overseas processed or landed in Canada, as soon as they arrive here, they have that permanent resident visa and they have access to the same settlement programs as other in immigrant newcomers in terms of, of uh, uh, language training, uh, employability, all those different programs. But they also get some extra um, entitlements because of their situation as refugees. So there's the immigration transportation loan there's the interim federal health care program, which provides uh, um, some specialized uh, health care services, such as mental health uh, counseling. Um, there have been cutbacks to that program, and some of them have been reinstated. We don't have time to get into that, but just so that you know that that's one of the programs I have access to. Uh, assisted refugees get, in addition, get assistance with temporary housing on arrival, startup allowance to help furnish their apartments, and they have one year of income support, which is more or less at the same scale as provincial social assistance rates. As for privately sponsored refugees, the private sponsored groups must provide basic needs, including housing and, and counseling support for 12 months. The federal government does not contribute any special programs for uh, privately sponsored refugees. And in regards to provincial supports and program entitlements, or indeed municipal, municipal contributions, you can't generalize. They really vary from, from place to place and from, from context to context. Private sponsorship, sponsorship groups, uh, as I mentioned, um, must support their sponsees for 12 months. But the, spons the sponsees, people sponsored, are supposed to try to become economically independent as soon as possible. Settlement organizations don't receive any federal funding to assist private sponsors or sponsorship groups. Doesn't mean to say that, pro that sponsors or privately sponsored refugees will be turned away from settlement organizations, it's just that they don't get any funding to help them. So the types of research that have been done on newcomer housing issues over the past uh, 15 years or so actually quite a lot of research, a huge amount of it um, thanks to the 17 years of the Metropolis Project, which um, with its um, academic community collaboration really did a huge amount to increase the evidence base for um, all kinds of areas of, uh, of settlement and integration of, um, of people in different uh, immigration, uh, immigration streams. So there are two types of studies that we can uh, consider, what we call point-in-time studies that have a retrospective component. How did things happen over time since you, since you arrived in Canada? And a lot of it is small-scale surveys and qualitative research. Single city studies with not a lot of comparability and methodology from place to place. However, some larger representative sample surveys where you would be able to compare two or three different cities. And then there have been large-scale uh, quantitative surveys with representative samples. The first one was uh, done on uh, the boat people uh, beginning, in, uh, beginning around 1980, and that, was, that actually is one of the few pieces of research that looked at the impact of private sponsorships, but it's a very old study now. 
Then there was um, a Quebec study following uh, a fairly large sample of immigrants over 10 years that arrived in the late 1980s. The Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Canada that followed the 2000-2001 cohort for four years. Um, this is shameless publicity here. I, uh, I was honored to be invited to write um, an article for Policy Option Politique uh, about the whole issue of housing for newcomers and especially refugees. And so I, I put up here the, uh, the first sentence of the article. Uh, for newcomers, obtaining decent and affordable housing in a safe and welcoming neighborhood is an anchor point for a new start. It's not just a question of shelter, but a place to seek out other resources such as healthcare providers, schools, language training, job counseling. It's a scaffolding for rebuilding a sense of feeling settled being at home. And that's even more true for refugees, of course. So it just speaks to this whole issue of how important it is to get people out of temporary housing and into a sense of permanency as soon as possible. Because uh, on the whole, prolonged stays in temporary accommodation lead to delays in accessing the resources people need for settlement. And that can delay eventual economic self-sufficiency. A couple of examples uh, here from a study that we did in Montreal a few years ago. The first quote that you can see here is uh, from a government-assisted refugee. And uh, he's, uh, he's talking about how amazing it was that uh, the settlement worker could help the family get settled. We arrived, a large family, the snow was falling, and she was the one that did everything with us with a lot of ingenuity because with a large family they had to split the family up between their two different apartments on the same floor in the same building. This really contrasts with Lara, the refugee claimant that we also interviewed. When I arrived I had, didn't know Montreal, I had no idea why, where I'd landed. When you look for housing you don't know anything about anything. You are just desperate to find a place to put yourself. I only saw the problems after I moved in, the mold and the rats. So it just uh, underlines how important that um, Personalized orientation is, and, and um, um, what can happen if people don't get that orientation. Uh, in the case of privately sponsored refugees, which I don't have an example of because there were so few of them in, uh, when we did this survey that there weren't enough for us to interview any, the sponsorship group is supposed to provide that really personalized orientation. So existing research um, uh, basically summarizes the, the um, main house, housing challenges that um, newcomers and especially refugee newcomers face in their early months, even in their early years. Um, on this slide here, the lack of credit history and references is a very well-known issue. Uh, overall financial precariousness due to not finding work or only finding very um, marginal work, and this is exacerbated by the, the transportation loan repayment, which has been widely criticized uh, and, and hopefully will, will be abolished eventually. Uh, discriminatory practices of various kinds can, can also create blockages in finding housing or in, in getting decent housing. Refugee claimants are particularly vulnerable to precarious housing because of their precarious immigration status. Whereas for government-assisted refugees, there's, there's a list of, of, of problems that um, don't always exist, but often exist and tend to be cumulative, especially since the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act of 2002, because uh, with that act, Canada agreed to take in a larger proportion of refugees considered high needs by UNHCR, whereas before Canada had tended to cherry-pick uh, uh, refugees and and um, so there's a large proportion of refugees with large families, many with um, high needs, with with um, kids kids with disabilities and so on. Um, many have limited education and literacy challenges, and none of these things are insurmountable. It's just that it creates barriers to economic self-sufficiency in the short term and a lot more supports and sometimes specialized supports are needed to for a successful settlement process into, into Canada. So the problematic outcomes that have been identified for, for refugees from, uh, from the government assisted stream and for, uh, and for refugee claimants especially, less so for non-refugee immigrants, 
people getting channeled into deteriorating rental stock with the risk of inadequate substandard unsanitary housing because that's the only type of housing they can access because of lack of income, because of discrimination, and so on and so forth. Unsuitable housing, so overcrowded, and a, a risk of homelessness because of constantly being in such a precarious situation, you're paying more than 50% of your income to rent. So just one extra expense, one month, and, 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 you, and you get into arrears. So um, a study that was um, that I um, that I led in Montreal a few years ago, which also had um, uh, was in a larger study with uh, Vancouver and Toronto, we actually found that the government-assisted refugees, even though they were permanent residents, were faring as badly as refugee claimants in terms of their experiences of uh, insanitary housing. But the government-assisted refugees were much more likely to have difficulties due to family size. And their, their options were limited to refugee-tolerant buildings, refugee-tolerant la to tolerant landlords in mediocre neighborhoods that they basically couldn't leave. So um, research in Vancouver, uh, Toronto, and Winnipeg has come up with similar findings. So these are fairly robust findings. And so I guess the key issue is how much of this uh, is likely to be an issue for, for the Syrian uh, refugees. A uh, more optimistic picture is uh, painted by the Longitudinal Survey of Immigrants to Canada. Uh, people in all refugee streams from those, that cohort from 2000-2001, after three or four years, were really catching up with the economic and family class immigrants in terms of economic and housing indicators. However, this was before the profile of the government-assisted refugees began to change. So, the economic integration of government-assisted refugees is slower now, according to IRCC's own data. Privately sponsored refugees, on the other hand, outcomes have improved. But we don't know much at all about the housing outcomes for privately sponsored refugees. There's only been one recent study. It was in Winnipeg. On the whole, it was strongly positive, but it does point to sponsorship breakdown as a risk factor for loss of housing. And it is something that is on the radar of uh, groups that are um, um, looking out for what is happening, what is going on with private sponsorships in the, main, the Canadian cities where most of the private sponsorships are, are happening, which are Montreal, Toronto, and Calgary. So um, I'm running out of time here quickly, but I'll, uh, I'll just go through some key issues, key, key numbers here for the Welcome uh, Syrians operation. So there have been almost 31,000 arrivals as of, um, as of the most recent data posted a couple of weeks ago. But the lion's share of those arrived in a four-month period. So that's a lot of people in four months. So it's quite... Um, understandable that for many settlement organizations and many municipalities it was uh, it was a huge challenge to get all these people all those people into into relatively permanent housing within a matter of weeks or in the worst case scenario months so how they break down between the immigration categories 53 percent in the government assisted refugee category 37 percent in the privately sponsored category and 10% in that hybrid category, blended visa office uh, referred. Now, in January, IRCC um, sent around some preliminary data on a profile of, uh, of the characteristics of government-assisted and privately sponsored refugees. And they sent this around to all the settlement organizations and anyone else who was interested. Uh, basically to give people a heads up on the issues of large families and uh, relatively low education and low language skills. Because um, while some people expected this, it was a surprise to others in some cities uh, to actually find that family sizes were so large and that there were a lot of people that that didn't even have literacy levels in 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 Arabic, for uh, for instance, let alone in in English or French. Now, it's a generalized profile, but but what you want to take from it is, on the whole, the profile of government-assisted refugees. Um, um, there are indicators of just more challenges to to easy settlement than for privately sponsored refugees uh, who. Uh, smaller families, many of them solo migrants, the majority know some English or French, so 
those you would think give people the potential to have an easier time with those early steps. On the other hand, the big caveat there is just because you have um, a higher socioeconomic status and less less um, less disadvantages up front, the, the, the traumas are invisible. So privately sponsored refugees are just as likely to have experienced traumas as the government assisted refugees. Uh, this is something that I just um, compiled over the weekend based on the, the, um, the data that's available online to give you an idea of the, the provincial breakdown of, um, of Syrians welcomed under the Welcome Syrians operation. So um, this goes from, um, from Newfoundland around here all the way to BC. There are, the, the numbers are too small for the Yukon for them to be published. So the distribution is sort of contained, is partially what you'd expect in terms of the, the largest numbers going to two of Canada's uh, big, Canada's two largest uh, immigrant receiving uh, provinces and, and, and indeed cities, uh, Ontario and Quebec here. But you would have expected BC to be third, and it isn't actually. It comes behind Alberta, which came to me as, as quite a big surprise. And there is the province of New Brunswick, which um, has received the highest number of refugees per capita of all the Canadian provinces and that was deliberate policy because it's part of, of, of New Brunswick's population and, and development policy. But now there are some issues uh, arising as to whether or not they're going to be able to retain all of those refugees. This is something we can go back to if people have questions, but I, I just wanted to put it out there for you. This one, there's a lot of numbers on there, but I thought I can't leave out any, off any of these cities because they all have something really, really interesting to say about them. The distribution by category between government assisted and privately sponsored is extremely variable from one city to uh, uh, to another. These these figures are actually quite stunning. We have um, uh, just when we look at um, the big three: Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. So we have um, um, a, a majority of private sponsorships and blended in Toronto, but a, a fairly small majority. Uh, in Montreal, we have absolutely massively private sponsorships and hardly any government assisted refugees. And it's a huge irony because the city of Montreal developed this very elaborate best practice protocol for, for, for making sure that, uh, that government assisted refugees would not fall into the cracks and end up in substandard housing because we have a big problem with that here. And nobody came. And it was because of the provincial government policy to decentralize government, um, deconcentrate government assisted refugees into, into the regions. In the regions, three quarters of the refugees are uh, government uh, sponsored and only one quarter are privately sponsored. So Montreal is an extreme case. Vancouver, Hamilton, and Winnipeg, Halifax, Fredericton, Ottawa, and some other cities I didn't have room to fit on here, like Kitchener and Hamilton, uh, Kitchener and London. Yes, they all have um, strong majorities of government-assisted refugees and relatively few privately sponsored. So, um, and I also rank these by. Um, Numbers, uh, absolute numbers of total, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, and, and London fit in here. And then in between Halifax and Fredericton, there's, um, there's St. John. But I wanted to put in Fredericton just to give you an idea that, 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 that um, a relatively small city with a relatively large number of government assisted refugees, almost, uh, and, and not very many private, private sponsored. So, um, yeah, so just uh, coming to uh, what, wrapping up now, the um, what seems to be emerging so far, and it's very very preliminary, is um, uh, people people are talking about the impact of delays in finding permanent housing in those cities where it was too difficult to get people settled quicker. Uh, every day, every week that you spend, uh, let alone month, in a hotel or in some other temporary accommodation. Uh, it's usually lost time to get for getting settled and finding work, and the sponsorship agreements and and uh, government assisted uh, process only lasts for a year. So so is a zero sum game there. You you lose time if uh, if you're not in um, 
in permanent accommodation. It takes you it, it takes longer before you can even start that process of getting into of getting into language training, job search, and so on. Even though settlement organizations sent um, people and programs into hotels, that that caused real difficulties, um, um, the loss of time. Um, there is an issue that we still don't know very much about of uh, short-term secondary migration to cheaper housing markets, sometimes even while people were still in hotels. And what happens then to their settlement organization support when they're supposed to be in Toronto and they move to Hamilton? Are they, are they being followed and helped? Affordability and suitability, as I mentioned, there was an issue of settlement organizations not really being forewarned about how many people with large families that they would be trying to receive. And when this happened in places with very tight housing markets like Vancouver and Toronto, there were, there were you know, Herculean and on the whole successful operations conducted to get those people into reasonable housing. In smaller cities or suburbs with cheaper housing, that's a strategy to avoid this type of crunch. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages depending on, depending on where and the scale. If you settle people in small communities and they have specialized mental, mental health needs, you're not going to have that critical mass of support workers in those small communities. You might also not have access to uh, um, jobs, uh, training opportunities, unless there is public transportation. On the other hand, there's the argument that uh, more uh, dispersal is likely to lead to, to greater inter intercultural contact, contacts um, and, 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 and um, uh, just a, a faster mutual acquaintance uh, between people in the receiving society and 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 and, and newcomers. So those are those are old arguments, but they, they they've been revived with the uh, welcome Syrians. So all kinds of tactics have been used to help the Syrians get into housing quicker. But the thing that's really new um, here is is um, an enormous recourse to what I call private sector uh, largesse. So um, Lots of little ad hoc local solutions with developers and landlords um, um, offering to offering to provide subsidies of one kind and another to to help people during that first year, but also a process that was coordinated by the federal government to to encourage encourage corporate donations to something called the Welcome Fund, and then to set up a system whereby the money from this fund would be would be uh, administered in different cities, in about seven different cities, by community foundations of Canada, and it would end up in the hands of um, of people actively involved in trying to get the refugees housed. And I think it's important to find out a lot more about how that actually worked. For the gov federal government, it was extremely neat and convenient because the federal government did not want to be seen providing extra funds for one group of low-income people in a tight rental housing market, i.e. refugees, when there are lots of people who are not refugees who are also suffering from extreme housing crunches in those markets. So it's a very neat and convenient solution, but it raises a lot of practical and philosophical issues that I'm sure we'll be debating for a while. So issues of adequacy and physical condition of housing being traded off against affordability uh, there are instances of short-life housing slated for demolition being used for refugees and there's a paradox there when the refugees need stability and who knows how long they're going to be able to stay in this short-life housing. So that's something that we, we need to know more about but I've, I, uh, I've come across a couple of instances of it so far. An issue that's been talked about a lot is the readiness of private sponsors. How knowledgeable are the private sponsor groups about the housing system, the housing market in their cities? Are they prepared for the full year commitment? Do they expect that their refugees will be able to become economically self-sufficient relatively quickly? So the last um, issue here is um, what's been called month 13. So the idea of month 13 is that the sponsorships, whether private or government-assisted refugees, last for 12 months. So after, after 12 months, um, the, the ones who don't have a job, they will go on to provincial, uh, provincial social assistance. So that income is basically stays the same, but it's from a different stream. But the other uh, 
the interim federal health care program comes to an end at that time, but probably what's more important is all these different private initiatives, the subsidies by individual landlords and by the Welcome Fund, are they going to come to an end at the end of month 12? Are they going to be renewed? What is going to happen? So people are concerned that month 13 will kind of um, create some sort of rupture or disjuncture uh, or at least hiccup in the, in the in the resettlement process when it's still uh, in relatively early stages. Other issues are disruptions due to involuntary moves and secondary migration because people can no longer afford the rent if the subsidies, um, private subsidies disappear. Are people going to trade off between other essentials to pay rent? What's the scale of the problem? And also, uh, who will be eligible to go into social housing? So it's not just a question of social housing supply. It's a question of eligibility because residency requirements differ from province to province. So I'll just end by saying, this is, it was already mentioned that I've just started a project. It's a work in progress uh, at the moment. We are, um, we're, we're looking at to witness testimony, testimony to the House of Commons and Senate committees last spring. We're looking at online media coverage from cities across Canada welcoming 50 or more refugees. And then we'll follow that with a small number of key informant interviews and some webinar discussions over the course of the winter. The PowerPoint of this talk is available as a PDF and there's a bibliography at, uh, at the end of it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Damaris, for sharing that overview of uh, what's going on with the, with the Syrians and, and uh, refugee housing issues in Canada. We're now going to take a moment and uh, flip our screen over to our second speaker. Uh, so if you just give us a moment there. And I'll introduce to you uh, Ray Silvius, who's assistant professor at the University of Winnipeg. Ray specializes on refugee and international relations and along with Welcome Place, the housing arm of the refugee serving organization, the Manitoba Inter Faith Immigration Council, raised in the midst of a three-year project on the housing outcomes of government-assisted and privately sponsored refugees who've recently arrived in Winnipeg, and the project's funded by the Manitoba Research Alliance. Uh, and Ray, along with Hani Al Alubidi, the housing counselor at Welcome Place, have uh, just written an op-ed piece that was published, in fact, today in the Winnipeg Free Press. And we've included this article for you as a handout that you can access through the webinar control panel. You'll see there's uh, there's a line that says handouts one to five, and it's uh, included for you as a PDF there uh, for your interest. So I now turn it over to Ray, who will talk about the uh, local context in, in Winnipeg. Welcome, Ray. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you to Dr. Rose for setting the table quite nicely here. And for all of our audience out there, whom I trust <laughs> are, are out there somewhere in the ether. This is a new format for me as well. I do I encourage you to, to take a peek at that um, very small piece because it actually um, puts some numbers on, on what it is that we are saying today, and I say we because I am doing this presentation solo, but it is in fact a reflection of a larger research initiative that involves Hani Alubedi, who could not be here today because of the day-to-day -day exigencies of housing refugees. So um, I'm carrying forward with, with his contributions in mind and trying to best represent those. And the reason uh, I, I direct you to that smaller piece is because uh, as you may have gotten the sense from, from Dr. Rose's presentation, we are really trying to, uh, as they say uh, in the business, pin jello to a wall with respect to this Syrian refugee uh, crisis and subsequent initiatives. The, uh, the entire phenomenon took the sector by surprise so quickly, and as you'll see in this presentation, the response by folks uh, such as Welcome Place was really quite phenomenal, but it is extremely difficult to wrap our mind around what it is precisely uh, hap that happened in that time. And so this presentation today is an opportunity to, to do that, and uh, we're hoping to get some stuff out the door moving forward that will also substantiate our claims a little bit more. But just to give you a sense of where we're coming from with all of this, we are in the midst of a three-year, what we refer to as a mini longitudinal project which involves myself and a wider research team and the Manitoba Interfaith Immigration Council and their housing arm, Welcome Place. And our intention in that 
study is to document the trajectory 21 uh, both uh, in total uh, families arriving to Winnipeg which are comprised of both government assisted refugees and privately sponsored refugees and we want to get a more intimate sense of what it is uh, that happens to them upon arrival in Winnipeg and we had basically done our first set of interviews with our families as of last November and then the Syrian refugee crisis hit and so we had some infrastructure in place to try to wrap our minds around what was quickly becoming a very pressing political issue but we were challenged by the fact that all of our community partners at Welcome Place were so overwhelmingly busy with the day-to-day -day necessity of housing incoming Syrians that we we had to respond fairly nimbly and flexibly and try to get the research out and so what you're seeing here today is is our attempt to do that we were able to place a couple of research interns at Welcome Place who actually supported the work of the housing teams which were responsible for finding uh, I hate the term permanent because in our experience it's not permanent housing but certainly longer term housing for the incoming Syrians and they were intimately involved with that experience on a day-to-day -day basis and on that basis we're able to report back as part of this research project so much of what you see here today in terms of information came from that community-based approach and, and our ability to work very closely with welcome place personnel on this. So just to give you a sense uh, Dr. Rose set this up quite well in terms of the, the macro Canadian perspective on Syrian refugees but uh, we're trying to dig down a little bit deeper into the organizational experience of Welcome Place with this study and so in terms of numbers what they experienced from early November when a trickle of incoming Syrians arrived in Winnipeg to about mid-March and, and that timing as we'll see later on in this presentation is quite important for a number of reasons. Welcome Place uh, saw uh, 766 government assisted refugees coming through their doors uh, out of the 928 Syrian arrivals to Manitoba and so as Dr. Rose indicated there and as many of you out there in the sector will uh, undoubtedly know uh, much more intimately than I do the needs of government assisted refugees uh, and the basket of supports that are available to them differ considerably from privately sponsored refugees but we wanted to just give you a sense here if you are not in the refugee serving sector and you're joining us today in this roughly four month period of time a welcome place was responsible for housing that large number of government assisted Syrian refugees whereas from the period of 2008 to 2013 we calculated the stats and uh, on average uh, 1167 refugees in total arrived in Manitoba uh, uh, over those years so this is just to give the indication of the overwhelming response that was required on the part of refugee resettling organizations like Welcome Place for the Syrians and this is quite important because one of our intentions here today and with our larger research initiative is to demonstrate that uh, there were a considerable number of things that happened and that arguably happened quite well in response to the Syrian refugee crisis in a very brief period of time and the important takeaway there is that we would like the good things that happened to be rendered part of the permanent settlement and resettlement landscape and by that we mean some of the political will and mobilization of resources at both the provincial level here and at the federal level which facilitated what we might assess as being the successful resettlement of Syrian refugees so more on that in a moment when we talk about Syrians we are talking about um, refugees obviously and yeah, for those of you in the sector it's very difficult and perhaps quite fruitless uh, and maybe even a little bit dangerous to differentiate between refugees from uh, different origin countries in terms of their needs. Now obviously there are particular needs with respect to the precise sort of trauma uh, experienced, the precise sort of trajectory which landed uh, such families in a place like Winnipeg, but ultimately with Syrian uh, refugees as with all refugees we're dealing with a cohort of individuals that have very complex housing needs one of the thing that we're one of the things that we're trying to do with this research uh, 
in the context of Winnipeg and Manitoba is to work through that with respects to the overall climate for low-income housing within the city of Winnipeg and within Manitoba and particularly some of the tendencies over the last 20 or 30 years with respects to supported social housing in the project or in the province rather and the intention there is to demonstrate that even though there were a lot of pretty fantastic things that happened upon uh, the arrival of the large numbers of Syrian uh, refugees uh, to successfully enable their settlement, we want to remind people that all of this is happening in an environment in which low-income housing is suffering from systematic decline in Canada in terms of supports. So more on that in a moment. What do we mean here though when we're talking about low income plus? So the low income part is pretty self-evident for the overwhelming majority of refugees that we see pass through the doors of Welcome Place, but the particular housing challenges uh, of the first cohort of Syrians were such that uh, there was a, a pretty strong political imperative coming from IRCC to uh, resettle such uh, families as quickly as possible. And this might be the norm for many cities in the country, but what Welcome Place personnel tell us is that this was in fact uh, an expedited period of time compared to what they are accustomed to uh, dealing with for resettling their incoming government assistance from transitional housing into a more permanent option. So in the case of the Syrians, Welcome Place is reporting to us that within 10 days of arriving in Winnipeg, the intention was to get them into housing within that 10 days. And this is important for a number of reasons that we'll touch on later, not the least of which is in order to get such a more permanent option, a number of policy mechanisms must be deployed extremely quickly. If not, you will see a situation that Dr. Rose referred to there with this sort of carousel uh, of moves or uncertainty within that first year of resettlement, which very much delays any sort of positive integration uh, potential for refugees. So those of you that are in the sector or those of you simply paying attention to some of the news uh, stories coming out of the Syrian refugee resettlement initiatives will have discovered that there was a considerable amount of attention being paid towards the notion of, of hotels. Now, hotels are perhaps being used increasingly with uh, refugee resettlement. One of the reasons we might argue is due to the insufficient amount of transitional housing stock being made available for, for such purposes. But what we here in Manitoba and in Winnipeg experienced due to a pretty strong mandate coming from the provincial government at the time is that Syrians would not stay in hotels upon arrival. And so this bears both economic and ethical and um, maybe even pragmatic uh, considerations. The intention in Manitoba was to uh, provide the most supported transitional housing environment possible and to also ensure that there was some sense of continuity and, uh, and community for incoming Syrians upon arrival. And so what we hear, I wish Hanny were here to better substantiate this claim, but what we hear from Welcome Place personnel is that any uh, government assisted refugee passing through their doors in the initial uh, resettlement initiative didn't end up in hotels. And so this is quite important and we want to demonstrate very briefly here today why that happened. So we're going to focus on really four things. Uh, these uh, sort of constellation of forces that enabled successful transitional resettlement for incoming Syrian government assisted refugees in Manitoba. The first of which being an increase in political will, the second of which being increase in welcome places human resource capability, the third being an increase in temporary housing or transitional housing options, and the fourth being an increase in long-term housing options specifically by way of the provincial rent supplement program more on all of that in a moment. And again, the intention here is to demonstrate that even though uh, the Syrian refugee crisis may have taken the refugee serving sector by surprise initially, the, the influx of refugees both from Syria and from other uh, 
countries to Canada and to a number of Canadian jurisdictions is unlikely to stop anytime soon. And so part of our argument here is to demonstrate, in fact, what an organization requires in order to continue to meet the needs of housing and resettling such refugees when they arrive in their cities. In the case of Welcome Place, they saw their staff increase from approximately 40 to 79 in that brief period of time where the overwhelming majority of the first cohort of Syrian arrivals arrived in Winnipeg. And so insofar as there was a success, uh, successful response from Welcome Place, it happened only by way of there being supports to effectively double their staff. Uh, it's important to note that these positions were in fact temporary. They were mostly funded by IRCC, but as Dr. Rose indicated, there were private mechanisms in place that supported such staffing increases. But the impression that we want to give here today, and Hanny certainly would have been much better suited to do this than, than I am able to, is that the people that were brought on board for the housing arm uh, in particular, as you see on this slide, there were nine additional, or sorry, a total of nine staff uh, which undertook housing initiatives to place incoming Syrians from the transitional housing the temporary housing to a more permanent option. So they effectively tripled their housing staff. They broke out into three teams of three which were charged with the task of rapidly responding to the incoming Syrians. These people were enormously skilled individuals. We hear from Hanny that uh, amongst them uh, was a former doctor, people with master's degrees, and more importantly people that spoke at least Arabic and English if not to additional languages and so we can expect that um, in order to serve the sector properly moving forward uh, continual funding for such highly skilled individuals is going to be required if we are to see the housing successes that we saw in the case of Welcome Place. So if staff was one part of the equation uh, another one was transitional housing and there might be some debate as to whether or not transitional housing is uh, at all better than hotels. It's unclear, however, whether or not the ongoing support of transitional and temporary housing stock, which enables uh, a first point of reference for incoming government-assisted refugees, it's not clear whether or not in the long run that is uh, actually more expensive than hotels. So in a piece that we are publishing with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives in Manitoba, hopefully within the next month, we detail this phenomenon in, in, in greater detail. But effectively, during the initial uh, uh, cohort of Syrians in early this year and late last year, IRCC spent approximately $15 million on 17 hotels to support that transitional housing upon arrival in Canada. And so the argument here, again, is that given that we can anticipate uh, incoming Syrian government-assisted refugees and refugees from other countries, all of whom require a, a, a stable temporary housing option, we want to start thinking very seriously about what it means to support in terms of transitional housing outside of simply house it, uh, subsidizing hotel rooms. In the case of Welcome Place, they had access to two buildings, predominantly by way of provincial funding mechanisms. The first of which, which we will call Building A for simplicity, uh, enabled uh, 30 additional units to be opened for Syrian families. These were rent supplemented units and while they were not permanent options, we heard a fairly positive response from uh, both refugees themselves and Welcome Place staff that this building enabled the creation of uh, a fairly important community atmosphere in that crucial stage of initial resettlement. Another one, uh, we will call it Building B, was leased to Welcome Place by the province of Manitoba for a dollar. It consisted of a three-month lease uh, with the possibility for renewal. However, it is no longer used for Syrian guards due to a host of complicated factors, uh, one of which simply being that the large influx of, of that first wave of Syrians subsided at approximately the same time that the lease expired. 
so that's the the context within which uh, Welcome Place staff were able to first of all find transitional housing, not hotels, for incoming Syrian government assisted refugees. Uh, the next part of the equation is long-term housing. And I won't belabor this point here uh, because you do all have access to this presentation and I encourage you to look at these figures maybe a little bit more closely after. But the point that we want to make is that that crucial transition from transitional housing to a more permanent option for not only Syrians but all government assistance refugees is coming in the context of the long-term decline of supported social housing within Canada in any jurisdiction. You see on this slide that Canada has the second lowest amount of social housing as a percentage of its overall housing stock of any advanced industrial nation at about 5%, the United States being uh, the only country that has a larger amount. So the point here is that any sort of successful outcomes for government-assisted refugees uh, has to happen within a context of an increasingly privatized housing market. In Winnipeg, uh, this uh, happens in a longer 20th century and now into the 21st century trend of there being chronically insufficient affordable housing stock. So what uh, incoming government assisted refugees are in fact doing is competing with other low income would-be Winnipeg home seekers uh, trying to basically find the best crumbs available in an already tight housing market. Since the early 2000s, Winnipeg's vacancy rate has been between 1% to 2% in terms of its, its rental units, which uh, makes it difficult to find a home at any stratum of the housing market, but it makes it particularly difficult to find adequate and affordable housing for incoming government-assisted refugees. Dr. Rose alluded to this in her presentation. In the context of Winnipeg, this notion of there being adequate and affordable houses, uh, it, it's really reached one, what one might refer to as a crisis proportion here in Winnipeg. As of 2011, more than 50% of Winnipeg's rental households have at least one of CMHC's core housing needs, often more than one those being costing more than 30% of income, being unsuitable in terms of number of rooms, and in need of major repairs. In the case of incoming government-assisted refugees, uh, we might be inclined to put the number of 30% uh, of income to much higher, perhaps to around 50%. And certainly, as Dr. Rose also demonstrated, with a large number of government-assisted refugee families having large families relative to the uh, rest of the population, housing stock is unsuitable in terms of size. So what we're seeing is a tight housing market, a housing market that does particularly poorly at the low end of the spectrum, and we're seeing a long-term plateau, if not a relative decrease, in terms of the housing supports that are available for government-assisted refugees and the house that are available. So. We refer to this in our research as a growing gap between the mandated housing supports and social supports for government-assisted refugees, which, uh, as many of you will know, comes primarily but not exclusively through the shelter allowance provided under the Federal Resettlement Assistance Program, and then the cost of available housing. So for those of you that may not know, the uh, housing provisions through shelter allowance for GARS is roughly equal to provincial levels. In the context of Manitoba, uh, the, the appropriate metric here is the Manitoba Employment and Income Assistance Housing Allowance, which becomes the basis for GAR supports for housing. Now, this was relatively unchanged for approximately two decades prior to 2014. So while you see uh, the support levels plateau, you see Winnipeg rental rates skyrocket by comparison. And just to put that home a little bit more forcefully, anecdotally, Welcome Place staff refer to times in the late 80s and early 90s when they were seeking homes for their refugee clientele. And they effectively had their pick of the litter in terms of Winnipeg rental units. 
some of which had uh, indoor swimming pools in uh, lovely newer apartment buildings, and that such buildings made an extreme, uh, extremely positive difference in the lives of incoming resettled refugees. This is clearly no longer the case, whereby the overwhelming majority of incoming GARs, be they from Syria or anywhere, uh, are forced to live in dilapidated inner city housing although this changed for the initial cohort of Syrians, which we'll talk about in a moment. Just to give you uh, an understanding here of the Manitoba resettlement assistant rates as of January 2014, and the reason why this is slightly old is because it's derived from a slightly old piece that uh, our research team put together. Just to put it in perspective, a family of four can receive a minimum of $471 for a shelter allowance, a maximum of 571 the average cost of a three-plus bedroom apartment in Winnipeg at roughly the same time, uh, you see the, the figures there from October 2013 to October 2014, uh, approximately $1,200 for such a unit when a family of four can expect a maximum housing allowance of uh, just shy of $600. And so the amount that incoming refugee families have to dedicate to their housing, which is probably insufficient and inadequate according to a host of other measures, is really quite, um, really quite difficult for them to manage. So um, as I alluded to though, a, a large number of incoming Syrians uh, over the course of last year and the first quarter of this year managed to find uh, what we might refer to as decent housing. Decent housing that met their needs in terms of units, in terms of cleanliness, in terms of uh, distance to amenities, but most importantly uh, housing that was made, uh, made affordable by way of one important provincial mechanism which we'll talk about here and that being the rent supplement program. Now, this was not something that was geared specifically to Syrians. However, our colleagues at Welcome Place uh, have told us about just um, how important this mechanism was for the purposes of resettling Syrians. This is a low-income supported house, housing um, supplement that is ostensibly available, or rather I should say was ostensibly available to any low-income home seeker in the province. However, the province uh, around the time of the first uh, influx of Syrians made this available um, to a greater extent at a micro level, at an organizational level, to Welcome Place to access units for their clientele. The RET supplement program, which has been put on hiatus, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, when it was enforced, uh, or rather when it was utilized, it was a mechanism whereby uh, Welcome Place could find homes for their uh, Syrian clientele uh, that would pay the difference between the market rate of the unit and the housing budget of their eligible candidates. So why did it work for Syrians? It was expanded uh, first and foremost. Um, an inventory of eligible units which was approved by the Manitoba government in terms of uh, the safety and cleanliness of the building uh, was was expedited and most importantly in the context of the rapid resettlement of Syrian refugees families were able to move in very very quickly after having arrived within that 10 to 14 day window where they were to get out of temporary housing and into a more permanent unit um, one of the key successes of this mechanism was simply the time frame within which it was mobilized and approved by the government for a transitioning um, cohort of Syrian refugees. So uh, what we found in, in our research and in our speaking with Welcome Place is that this radically expanded the range of houses that they could seek for the purposes of resettling their Syrian government assisted refugee clientele. This involved going to neighborhoods that were typically outside of um, their GAR housing searches just by virtue of the expense of the housing and importantly for Syrians uh, this enabled uh, Welcome Place to access more expensive units and uh, units which had more bedrooms which was uh, to enable the settlement resettlement of larger families. I'm 
conscious of time here, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. Uh, the point that we want to emphasize here is that uh, coinciding with the end of the first influx of Syrians to Winnipeg and a Manitoba provincial election, the program has effectively been put on hiatus since April 2016, at least from Welcome Place's purposes, uh, for their purposes and for their ability to access rent supplement for their incoming GAR clientele. Um, the point that we want to make here is that not only are maybe another 900 or so Syrian fam, uh, or individuals, uh, the vast majority of which are government assisted refugees, are to arrive here in Winnipeg by the end of the year, but we want to think through the successes of the first wave of Syrian refugee resettlement uh, and use that to, to uh, advocate for long-term housing supports, or at least me, as a university researcher, wants to advocate for that based on the data that we are getting from the sector. So what would help this second wave is a restoration of the rent supplement programs. But ultimately, what, what I would like to see happen is an expansion of the rent supplement program for all incoming government-assisted refugees. And also, uh, as uh, Dr. Rose alluded to earlier, we are seeing privately sponsored refugees in precarious housing situations as well due to sponsorship failure. We are certainly seeing that in the context of our own research. I strongly believe that it is time that we include privately sponsored refugees in the discussion of rent supplementation and social and supported housing needs. But more importantly, what we need to do for the sector, in my estimation, um, what we need to support uh, through research is to find ways to convey all of the political capital and goodwill that was evident during the initial Syrian refugee crisis into permanent supports for the sector and hopefully we can contribute to that conversation in some small way. So cognizant of time, I will wrap it up here and I look forward to your questions. Thanks for listening everyone. Thank you so much, Ray, for, for that presentation, for showing us what's taking place at the local level in, in Winnipeg. And so we do have uh, another five or 10 minutes or so for questions. So just to uh, remind those of you who are still on the line with us, and thank you for being here, uh, you can type your questions uh, directly uh, through the control panel um, to me and I can read them out to uh, Damaris and to Ray and if uh, if your question is addressed to either one or the other you can indicate that when you type it in as well so that uh, I can address it to one or the two of them. We do have a few questions um, in the queue. So I'm going to have um, both Damaris and Ray, you're both uh, unmuted, so you can both respond to to the questions. We have one here that um, is more addressed to, to Damaris uh, that came up earlier when you were just finishing your presentation. Um, and, and it asks that um, as much of your information that you're doing your current research is urban in nature, do you have some information uh, or does the research that you're doing provide information more related to rural areas? And this particular question is asking about uh, New Brunswick and what it might mean for the province. So Damaris, uh, does your research uh, look at uh, outcomes in, in rural areas as well? And can you share any of that? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Uh, we are we are just um, starting um, the research, and I, I should explain as as a, as a caveat that it's a small budget and it's a very short uh, time frame. So, what I said in the proposal is that we would really try to get um, go pan Canadian, and um, for the. Um, um, for the uh, for the analysis of of um, of published um, media reports, that we would look at all commute. We would we would try to find um, online media coverage for all communities where there were more than a hundred refugees uh, settled. Uh, in practice, when I look at the numbers um, of uh, of the refugees welcomed in different communities, I'm trying to lower that to 50. So that every place that had that took in more than 50 refugees, I'm going to look at. But I, um, we can't really go down to you know what happens to 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 no, to three refugee families in you know in one tiny place. Although I have to say, I mean, I've downloaded all those stories from that, that I've that I've come across. But we can't use all of them because. Uh, 
it, it, at a certain point it's not it, it's not systematic enough data so when you say rural it depends I mean small towns for sure and I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of the um, of the new Brunswick policy um, to um, um, as I said, per capita, per capita, uh, New Brunswick has welcomed a very high number of refugees, and they are they are um, they are spread out between those smaller southern cities. And I know I've also been reading in uh, Lacadie Nouvelle and the other uh, um, the other and the other Acadian sources to try to find out how many have been going to some of those uh, smaller places. And so, yes, I do have information about it, but the volume of material of reporting is too huge to include everywhere. So, um, we have we have come up with a decision not to look at places that took in, uh, not to look in a systematic way at places that took in less than 50. I mean, ideally, you'd like to cover every community that even took in one family, and hopefully, there'll be other research that might be able to do that. But those were those were the choices that we made. So it's not based on the size of the place; it's based on the number of refugees that they took in. If that's going to be our our criterion, and I think in the witness testimony to the to the Senate and the House of Commons committees, there, um, I can't remember who was that, who presented from New Brunswick, and I don't have that information there. But but there were some uh, there were some people from smaller communities that presented. And so we do have that material as well. Great. Thank you very much, um, Damaris. And there is a question here um, about the slides and the availability of the presentations following. And I just want to confirm that um, if you check back in the next few days to the CHRA website under our programs and under webinars, we will be posting the PowerPoints and there will also be a recording of the webinar as well will be posted there. So you can follow up with the slides and, and with the bibliography and uh, information in both the presentations as well. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, Ray, we have a question for you. Um, do you know if any other provinces had a retin supplement program for their newly arrived Syrian population, or was it just Manitoba? That's a great question. And actually, uh, Dr. Rose and I were speaking about this last week when we were doing some trial runs for, for today's presentation. And if I recall correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Demers, but uh, we didn't know, and it was actually information that we were looking for ourselves. The best I can say is is I don't know, um, but hopefully what, what we can do with this research is demonstrate uh, really how successful that was in the Manitoba case and in the Winnipeg case. And the the information is largely anecdotal right now because it's coming from Welcome Place or from Syrian government assisted refugees that we're speaking with. But the real litmus test will be first of all whether or not it's renewed for the for those who are already uh, receiving it during their their first year leases. If not, we can expect them to uh, move into uh, a, a far less adequate and certainly uh, less affordable housing situation. And then uh, will it be made available for incoming Syrian guards over the course of the year? And will it be made available for guards after that? So if anybody has that information, we would certainly like to hear it. Um, but we honestly don't know right now. Can I, if I could just say something very quickly. Um, the issue is one of jurisdiction. Those program, those types of rent supplement programs, uh, just like social housing, are provincial responsibility, and so the provinces set the rules, and different provinces have different eligibility requirements. So the big issue is um, the concept of residency. I don't have an up-to-date, up-to-date information about all the provinces' res residency requirements, but many provinces will say for access to X, Y, and Z social program, you have to have residency requirement of X months or one year or two years. And if I have a residency requirement, let's say, of one year before you can even go on the waiting list for social housing or be eligible for a rent supplement, then that's not going to help newly arrived refugees. But provinces will never, will always want to apply the same rule to everybody. So. Either they get rid of residency requirements, or they keep the residency requirements and say, well, providing additional assistance to newly, re newly arriving refugees, it's not our problem, it's the federal government's problem, and the federal government should be paying for it. But it would be great if somebody has all that information compiled. 
But it's very hard because the rules change all the time. You have to. Uh, you, I've looked at it for other programs, not for not for rent supplement or social housing. But if anybody does have it, let us know. Absolutely. <laughs> Compile for all the provinces. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've got you've had that call out there. So if uh, anyone has that information, you can certainly send it to me at CHRA and uh, I'll share it with our, our two professors here. Um, another question coming in is is uh, asking uh, particularly uh, Damaris in in your presentation, you had indicated that um, for both the privately sponsored and government sponsors, there's a, approximately a year of uh, social supports um, and services that were provided, and that that was proving uh, to be inadequate in terms of the the length of support for not everyone had found yet uh, job stability or even housing stability at that point. Do you have any indication in your research what might be a better timeline or commitment uh, for uh, either private sponsorship or government support for refugees to, to stabilize in housing? Yeah, that's something that really um, experts from the settlement organizations that have had a lot of experience with the higher needs GARs would be much better place to answer than uh, than than myself but um, I you know I would say that it depends there are um, um, there are people who are able to uh, there are people who are able to find work within a number of months but 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 many do not and and there are many different factors that will that will affect that um, so I would I think it's I think it's very difficult to answer. I mean, I think the main thing that we do know is that it is unlikely that a very high percentage of uh, of households or, or families in the current wave of, of, of Syrian GARs, it is unlikely that a very high percentage will be economically sufficient by the end of by the end of year one. Okay, and, do you and find so that's why we need to think about other kinds of support, such as access to 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 social to to social housing or rent supplement housing that will that will stabilize their the, the single most important item in their in their budget and other things um, you know would be considered um, the federal child benefit program has been improved and everybody has access to that and and you know other ways that that could be um, beefed up even more so that um, that would provide an additional help to people with large families but not 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 uh, particularly for refugees for everybody so that would be that would be something else to consider but I don't I don't know if anybody's going to come up with an idea no we should kind of increase the for everybody that the sponsorship period from one year to two you probably wouldn't get any private sponsors if you increased it to two years it would be too terrifying it's such a huge commitment just think of you know of, of how much those sponsorship groups are are contributing. You know, I think you know more of an issue is 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 um, this this question of the mismatch between uh, um, between the between the allow the wrap allowances and uh, and the housing costs in large housing markets. But you can't increase the wrap allowances unless you also increase provincial welfare rates, right? Because they're supposed to be equivalent. So it's very tricky. <laughs> A lot to consider. And just conscious of the time, uh, do though, before we go, just wanted to ask Ray, do, do you have uh, anything to add to uh, what uh, uh, Damaris was just saying or, or in conclusion as well? well? I think she hit the nail on the head with respect to this idea that um, bureaucratically and in terms of policy, the, um, the major challenge uh, facing um, a, a, I think a healthier and more supported resettlement is the fact that RAP rates are tied to provincial social assistance rates and so that's where the, the point of, of, of pressure and, and um, discussion needs to occur and really uh, any sort of temporary measures uh, that can be utilized to to benefit a particular cohort of incoming refugees uh, is is really just a, a pebble of sand on the beach and it, it's very helpful um, and certainly appreciated by those who receive it but there are some long-term structural changes to policy that need to be done here in order to um, really address some of the the divergent tendencies between support and rental rates in large markets in the last 
20 or 30 years. I mean, we're seeing it in places like Winnipeg as much as we were seeing it in places like Toronto and Vancouver. And so that's where I think the discussion needs to go. Well, on that note, uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, professors Damaris Rose and Ray Silvius for your time and speaking with us today on a very uh, relevant and important uh, topic in terms of uh, the Syrian refugee and uh, housing issues in Canada. So thank you very much for participating and thank you as well to our audience. CHRA's next webinar will take place November 17th and we'll look at how housing policy benefits from a socioeconomic perspective. And on December 13th, our webinar will focus on driving new housing supply across Across a range of affordability options. Be sure to check out the CHRA website at chra-achru.ca slash programs for more information on our webinar lineup. And uh, that's where today's presentation will also be made available in the coming days. So thank you again and bye for now.